Welcome to the High Income Business Writing Podcast, helping you propel your writing business to a whole new level. And now, here's your host, Ed Gandia. Hey there, welcome to the High Income Business Writing Podcast. I am your host, Ed Gandia, and this is the podcast for business writers and copywriters who want to earn more and less time doing work they love for better clients. Just a quick reminder that you can find detailed show notes for this episode at b2blauncher.com forward slash episode 162. And those notes are going to include a summary of our discussion as well as links to resources we mentioned during the show. Now, before we get to this week's episode, I have just a quick announcement. I recently opened some slots to personally guide a handful of writers who already have paying clients but aren't yet earning $2,000 a month consistently. If that's you, I'd like to work with you over the next six months to get you to that level. I still have a couple of spots left, so if you'd like to learn more, send an email to ed at b2blauncher.com and just put the word accelerate in the subject line and I'll reply with all the details. Now I had a friend who was married to a lawyer and she used to joke that when she was having trouble falling asleep, she'd ask her husband to talk about copyright law and apparently that worked way better and faster than taking an Ambien. (laughs) And in all seriousness, copyright law is an important topic when when you're a freelance writer copywriter and you're working for clients even if it's boring now i'm not an attorney i don't play one on the internet so to cover this material i brought in internet business lawyer richard chapo to give us the scoop on what we need to know on protecting ourselves from the most common and avoidable copyright pitfalls Richard is located in San Diego, California, and he's been practicing law since 1992. He specializes in helping online entrepreneurs like ourselves avoid what he likes to call crap your pants, copyright infringement letters, and other threats when operating online. And I got to tell you, as dull as this topic can be, Richard does make it interesting. He makes it relevant. He makes it, keeps it engaging. He also illustrates many of his points with specific and useful examples, which I found extremely helpful. So listen, not the most exciting topic in the world, but I urge you to give this one a listen. This is important stuff. Enjoy. Hey, Richard, great to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Well, I'm always scared, you know, when I, when I bring an attorney on the show. It's only happened a couple of times, but uh, <laughs> this is we're going to be talking about some important stuff and and a lot of questions that um, that listeners ask me. So it really, it is a pleasure to ha- to have you on, so you can help clarify some of these things that um, that uh, many of us are wondering about and are faced with every day. But before we get to that, um, why don't you give us a little bit of, of background uh, about yourself? Maybe a little bit about the kind of work you do, the kind of clients you work with, and that kind of thing. Sure. Um, I've been an attorney since uh, 1992. Um, worked in litigation initially. Um, you know, back in '92, the internet really wasn't a functioning commercial medium, although it certainly had academic applications. Um, so I was doing wrongful death defense work for hospitals and doctors, or a patient passed away, and there were claims that uh, they shouldn't have. And uh, did that for about 10 years. Spent a year in Russia, of all places, uh, teaching and. Uh, then came back and got into internet law. Um, and clients are representative businesses typically. Um, a couple of writers, but n- nothing really ongoing. Um, but a lot of internet businesses, that's really my focus. Um, you know, when I got into it in 2000 or so, uh, there were very few laws. Um, it was really kind of the wild, wild west, it was the, the old cliche. Uh, and it's been unfortunately getting a little more technical since then. Um, from the legal perspective. And so, you know, I try to help clients um, by being proactive and, and help them avoid um, some of the binds and pitfalls that are out there. Now, when you say internet businesses, are there certain categories that you uh, work with a lot uh, within that realm? Uh, you know, not really. It's kind of changed over the years. It's really depended dependent on kind of popular business models. Um, but I work with everything, everybody from publishers in Japan to um, you know large, well-known bloggers to dating sites to um, technical companies that have websites where they're providing not so much sales but information on their products. Uh, where they're doing you know, a lot of technical writings being done to try to explain you know how to use the product and how to deal with certain situations, things of that sort. Um, so it kind of runs a gamut. Gotcha. 
All right. Uh, so, so good stuff. And you know our world. You understand, you know, what writers face. I mean, we're working with clients and we're producing work for them. And, you know, sometimes writers wonder, well, gosh, you know, what, what are my, what are my risks here? What are the potential pitfalls? Um, in fact, I, I, I'm curious when, when, when we are producing as writers work for clients, I'm curious what you've seen or, or some of the most common mistakes uh, we make uh, that, that could get us in trouble. Sure. Um, so maybe before we talk about that, let me just state um, any podcast on legal issues has a tendency to become a slight horror film where by the end of the podcast, you've decided, you know, it's best just to give up the profession, move into a cave somewhere and, uh, you know, subsist on blueberries. Um, <laughs> that, that's not really the purpose of this. Um, the law in these areas, there can be some scary aspects to it. Um, but there's also the practical aspect that particularly if you're a writer and you're, you're providing content to a company uh, or to a client that is anything other than tiny, um, y you know, anybody who's looking at copyright infringement claims is primarily going to look at um, your client, not at you. Um, because for the simple reason that most people are going to view writers as not having sufficient assets to, to make it worth pursuing them, uh, you know, the blood from turnip concept. Um, so that's, keep that in mind when we talk about these issues because sometimes it can be a little scary. Um, but in the practical, real world, um, you don't see these issues come up a lot just for that simple reason. So uh, common occurrences, um, the beauty of the Internet is it is... Uh, singularly the greatest information distribution system that's ever been created. Uh, the downside of that is it's also trying to um, address issues like copyright and protection can be difficult because you run into situations where trying to determine if something is protected legally uh, and, you know, and can't be used without permission can be tough. Um, so the, one of the primary, I think the primary issue that you run into with writers is really sourcing. Where are you getting your information? Um, it sounds like a simple thing, and most writers who are listening to this are probably going to understand this and you know roll their eyes. Um, but if you're going to source information from somewhere, you know, if you're writing a sales piece or whatever, you include a graphic, you include um, a photo, you, you you know you rewrite something that's out there. Um, you know, you have to be very careful about your sourcing because if you give something to your client and they get sued over it, they're not going to be happy. Um, and you're also potentially liable for that. So sourcing is incredibly important. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, there's a site up, Web Copy Plus, and they talk about a situation where one of their writers grabbed a picture and, you know, they didn't know. Um, they didn't know that it was infringing or anything of that sort, and you know they started getting the legal letters and threats of lawsuits, and they ended up having to settle for four grand for one picture. And the reason for that is copyright law is just not very flexible or friendly to defendants. And you know we'll get into the specifics of it a little later. But um, the point is, is that you need to source that, and particularly when you're writing for clients, you need to be more conservative than if you were writing for yourself. So if you had your own blog and you're writing about something controversial, you know, Donald Trump or the latest Star Wars movie, whatever it is, um, you know, fair use issues and things of that sort, you can really delve into and, you know, be comfortable with your risk. But if you're dealing with clients, you want to give them things that are clean uh, and you want to be absolutely sure about that and know where you're sourcing your content. So that's probably the biggest issue that I run into. Um, the second issue I see is deals with something called attribution. Um, you'll see a post online or photos or things of that sort, and people will link back to the source where they found their content. Um, so let's say you include a graphic from you know, a website and you include it in whatever the pitch is you're writing or technical measure, whatever it is. Um, attribution is a defense to a plagiarism claim. It is not a defense to a copyright infringement claim. Um, so what, what does that mean? So so plagiarism, you know, we all wrote our thesis at one point or another, you know, college or what have you. Uh, in that situation, plagiarism is really an academic concept, um, although it can be civil. It's, it's kind of copyright infringement by another name, but you're giving credit to different people. Well, with copyright infringement, attribution is not a defense. It, you can't, if I take Stephen King's book, latest book, and I copy it, and I resell it or I republish it on my blog, you know, the full thing, and I put a link to Stephen King, well, that's not a defense. It just isn't. Um, and if, in fact, it's actually worse because when you put that link there, you're not only saying, I don't understand copyright infringement law, but I intentionally copied it 
<laughs> and here's evidence that I, mm-hmm. you know, here's where I found it. Uh, and so in court, when they're determining damages in a copyright infringement case, a lot of it comes down to, you know, what was the willfulness on your part? Um, you know, were you an innocent infringer, meaning, you know, you're a 13 year old who had no idea? Um, you know, or are you somebody who's more savvy, more knowledgeable, and understands some of these concepts? And if you're a copywriter, uh, professional copywriter, the court's not going to be very lenient on you. They're going to assume that you have an understanding of copyright. Um, and so you want to be very careful of attribution. Now, you will see attribution out there. So why do we see it? Why do we see it on photos and things of that sort? Certain content providers, such as Creative, the Creative Commons license, um, will allow you to use content if you have attribution. So when you see these things out there, that's typically why it's there. Um, or the people are just confused. But um, So when, when you're looking at content, you know, the biggest issue is, um, you know, do you have the right to use it? If you don't have the right to use it, how can you get it? And here's the thing about copyright infringement that a lot of people don't understand. Ask. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just ask. And in a majority of cases, you'd be shocked. People will give you uh, permission and just make sure it's in writing. And and that's fine. And you can go for people, uh, people online, particularly in the Internet environment where we share everything. They're much more receptive to the idea of giving people consent to go ahead and do things. Uh, and use their content and what have you. And they'll say, well, yeah, I want to link back or something of that sort. Now, that's a, that's a good approach. Versus if they just find that their content has been stolen in their mind and put up somewhere, you know, now they're angry. Um, and so it's kind of a different, different mentality. But, uh, you know, for a lot of my clients, I just say, ask. Um, you know, send an email and what have you. And you'd be shocked at what people will <laughs> give you permission to use. Um, so that's certainly a, an aspect of it. Um, the second thing is when you're sourcing your, your, your work, um, the resources that you're using, keep a record of it. When you, when you get a copyright infringement claim, they have to prove um, that, one, it was a copyrighted work. Two, um, that you essentially copied it. You accessed it and copied it in some manner. Okay, and that's typically done by showing exact um, elements of the text or what have you uh, that are in both pieces. Well, copyright, particularly in the online environment, can actually be a, a tricky deal because um, there are a lot of different subjects that are written about that are very similar. Um, so let's say a study comes out on nutrition, on you know, some kind of a nutrition aspect, and you're writing a piece for a you know, weight company selling weight loss products or something of that sort. Well, there may be 100 you know, articles on that study. And in many ways, they're all going to be pretty similar because they're talking about the same thing, the same facts coming from that study and what have you. And if you have somebody who's a copyright troll or not even a copyright troll, but just somebody that's aggressive, you know, they may start serving DMCA notices on the other parties. They may start you know, sending cease and desist letters and demands for settlements and things of that sort. And if you have a record showing you went and looked at the study, here's the date that I did it, here are my notes, boom, 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 and you go into court. Um, you know, you're going to be in a much better position. And this is one thing to understand about copyright law that is kind of interesting. Um, most attorneys probably wouldn't say this or agree to it in public, but a judge has a lot of leeway in a copyright infringement case. And judges pay a lot of attention to the, how the plaintiff acts. Um, and so if the plaintiff is overbearing um, in the workup of the case, uh, is, you know, not taking a reasonable position on settlements and things of this sort, you will find judges will not be very receptive to to their claims, and even if there's a technical infringement, uh, you know judgments awarded are you know can be quite low, um, two hundred bucks let's say, uh, and you know with no award of attorney's fees or anything of that sort, which makes it you know essentially a loss for that person. Um, now obviously you don't want to go that far, but the point is is that you know try to keep notes of these things, try to keep a record of it. Um, obviously you know that provides you a basis for defense. Uh, you know, if you're outright copying something from somebody else, you know, don't do that. Um, cause that'll be evidence against you. I think that the, uh, final area that we see problems, um, is, is fair use. So the concept of fair use is, um, a case by case determination, unless it's an obvious situation. The basic idea of fair use is really misunderstood. The basic idea of copyright law is that we're going to give the creator of the work, the right to control that work. However, there are certain situations that as a matter of public policy, we want others to be able to, quote unquote, use that work. Okay, and that's, that's really all we're talking about with fair use. Um, so, uh, Star Wars The Last Jedi comes out, you think it's a horrible movie, and you write a review. Okay, well, reviews are almost always going to be protected because that's providing a benefit to society. 
this is a terrible movie, this is a great movie, whatever. Um, you know, reviews of, of services. Um, you know, this dentist is wonderful, this dentist is horrible. Um, these kinds of things, you know, they're always going to be allowed under the fair use analysis. However, fair use, there's some tricky things about fair use. One, fair use is only really ever determined at trial. So you have to go spend, all the way to trial. <laughs> right. In order to determine that. So even if you win at trial, you're going to spend a lot of money in attorney's fees, um, and you're not going to get those attorney's fees back typically. So even if you win the case, they're not going to award you attorney's fees. Now, you can sometimes get out earlier on a motion for summary judgment, which is a, a technical motion that happens after discovery. Um, but in most cases, judges are going to let it get to uh, trial, and so you end up spending a bunch of money. The problem with that is that you're not writing for yourself. You're writing for your client. You know, you want to deliver your client content that they can use that's clean and they can be happy with. You don't want to deliver them content that is going to, um, you know, cause them potential litigation, costs, things of that sort. So when you're writing content for clients, you know, I always try to tell my, you know, the people that I represent is, you know, again, be conservative, be clean. If you're claiming fair use, it needs to be an obvious fair use situation, an obvious news case, an obvious parody an obvious review, and you may want to talk to an attorney just to make sure, because you don't want to give your clients problems. Um, and if uh, you know, if you do, <laughs> they're not going to be a client for much longer, um, and you can guarantee that you know they're going to uh, spread the word, you know, that you deliver them this content that's a horrible, horrible situation for them. And this happens all the time. And you know, most people are listening to this, you know, you may have a website, and you did your first website, and you hired some cheap person off of you know one of the freelance uh, sites to build the website for you. Well, go look at your website. Do you have photos? Where did those come from? Yeah. yeah. Or were they licensed correctly? And a lot of their attorneys that make a lot of money sending out cease and desist letters because the answer is no. <laughs> well, so, so let me ask you, because you've mentioned uh, images and, and graphs. You've mentioned content. Uh, one of the situations uh, writers run into frequently, especially if you're doing – uh, producing work for clients where there's research required. So the client might give you some of that background materials, but many times you have to go out and do some research yourself. Uh, is quoting statistics from research studies and quoting, you know, findings and insights and so forth. And of course, giving proper attribution. I mean, most writers do that. But am I hearing you correctly in that, you know, even in those situations that many of us feel are commonplace? Um, we have to be really careful and maybe even consult with an attorney uh, if, if we're quoting a, a study or some kind of research report, as an example. Um, quotes that are short and quotes that address facts, um, you don't really have to worry about. So the copyright is really intended for longer, um, you know, anything over a paragraph, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is where you really start looking at it. So, for instance, recipes, a strange subject, but recipes, um, you, you typically cannot copyright a recipe uh, because there's not enough creative work there. You can't copyright the title of a book uh, unless it's a series. But, um, you know, you have these kinds of issues. And facts are never copyrighted. You can never copyright facts. Um, so with a study, you can almost always go in and do that. And when you're writing about a study and you're including that study, you're also almost always... Um, adding some kind of a, an element of review of that study. You're either saying the study is producing positive results that support our, our you know, argument or not. Exactly. Um, so, th so there's an element of fair use in that. I wouldn't worry about that. What I'm talking about more is people go to sites and they'll take, um, I see this all the time, they'll take a graphic. So the, they'll go out and they say, I need a map of the United States. And they go hunt around and they find one that they like and they just take it. Yeah. And they, and they say, well, it's a map of the United States. Well, yeah, it's copyrighted work. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you can't just take it. Um, you know, and this is kind of an example of what I was talking about earlier. If you contact the person who created that map, they will almost always give it to you. They'll just say, oh, yeah, hey, you know, I appreciate it. You can give me a link. Um, but if you just take it and then suddenly it's appearing, um, you know, in, in some kind of work, particularly if it's online and can easily be found, you know, then they're a little aggravated. Um, but, yeah, no, short, short quotes, you're fine. Um, Finding facts. statistics. What about when you get into, because I know this can be a gray area, intellectual property. So, for instance, you're quoting, hey, so-and-so, uh, Bill Smith, you know, has this process for determining the answer to X. And it's basically, you know, these four steps. 
Uh, but that, that's a small part of the overall work you produce, and it's just really an illustration. Something like that, where you're now it's no longer a fact or statistic. Now you're quoting intellectual property. It's yeah, you're you're strictly liable um, for that kind of infringement. So you have to be very careful. The only real defense to that is to claim fair use. Um, so with fair use, you're looking at um, four elements and. Uh, uh, People out there, some people think fair use is a very simple concept, and let me explain just really short, brief example of why it is not. Dancing Baby, um, Lens versus Universal Music Corp, is a case that went on for 10 years. It went to the Supreme Court, and so you had uh, the case involved a woman who would taken a video of her baby dancing to a Prince song for 20 seconds. And they spent 10 years litigating over whether <laughs> that was an allowable use, whether it was a violation of copyright law, whether it was a violation of the DMCA or the DMCA was abused, all these issues. And I can guarantee you the 70-year-old Supreme Court justices never in their life thought they would ever be looking at a video <laughs> of a baby dancing and listening to a Prince song and trying to determine if it was infringement or not. <laughs> so fair use, you know, the point with fair use is that it's very... It's, it's you know it's a moving concept, and I'll be honest with you as an attorney, I've looked at cases um, that I see reported. You know, decisions have come down, and in reading the facts, I'll say that's fair use, and the decisions the other way. And conversely, I've had ones where I said that's not fair use. There's no way. Um, you have Google. Google just started copying libraries of books and putting them online, and Google was in effect monetizing that. So they would have the book. You could go read excerpts from the book. And then on the side column, they would have a link to somewhere where you could buy the book, which, of course, Google is making money from. To me, you know, that's pretty classic infringement. And the courts bent over backwards to say it was fair use. Um, and it was a decision that a lot of us were just like, wow, really? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. because, because it really hurts authors, to be quite honest. Um, so fair use is kind of this crazy concept. But if in that situation where you're dealing with IP, where you're talking about the concepts that people have come up, you know, the concepts cannot be copyrighted. You can't copyright a concept. It has to be, you know, fixed work, essentially. Um, but, you know, you do get into questions about, you know, is it a derivative work and what you're creating? Probably not. Um, so is fair use a defense? And you say, well, okay, fair use is a defense. Um, so with fair use, you're looking at really four factors. Uh, the purpose and character of your use of the content, uh, the nature of the copyrighted work, the amount uh, of the work that you use, and then also um, the effect upon the potential market for the person who owns the copyright. So in the IP situation, um, you know, if we think about what's the purpose and character of your use, well, you're really using it as part of a bigger piece. You're not really trying to copy their study and reproduce it for any particular benefit directly from that study. You're, you're creating a different piece on a different subject uh, and incorporating that in. So you're probably okay on there. The nature of the copyrighted work, it's a study, it's a creative work, they've put time and effort into it, so that's not in your favor. So that factor's not in your favor because it's, it's, some, it's not a timeline of historical facts uh, where there's very little copyright protection. Um, the amount, and so, you know, the amount of the work that you've taken, well, you know, in this situation, it sounds like we're probably taking a really small amount. Um, you know, it's not like we're reproducing the entire study, uh, and, you know, there's an attribution link back to it. I wouldn't you know, be careful with the link, but, yeah, you know, we're mentioning, we're giving credit. It's not like we're taking their study and trying to republish it as our own. You know, this isn't Milli Vanilli. Um, so, you know, you're, you're probably in good shape on that fact. And then the effect on their potential market. Well, it's not really going to have any effect on their market. It, if anything, it's probably beneficial because it's getting word out that there's a study. So in that situation, you'd have to think fair use is a pretty strong defense because of the four factors. Three are probably in our favor. Um, and so, you know, from that perspective, you know, you're probably okay. Now, as a writer who's creating content, are you going to do that analysis? No. <laughs> no. Yeah. And should you call an attorney every time? Hey, I'd love you to call me every time, but I'm going to charge you. Um, <laughs> you know, and so that becomes an issue there. Um, so, you know, in those situations, you kind of have to play it by... Um, you know, off the cuff, and I, you know, I think that you tend to be okay. Now, again, looking at it also depends on you know how are you treating that content. Are you treating it positively? Um, you know, then you're probably going to have fewer problems because most people are happy to get the compliment. If you're saying this study is nonsense, um, you know, or these 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 facts are you know drawn into doubt, well, you know then maybe you have an issue. I'll give you an example. I represent a band, worst decision I ever made in my life. Um, you know, the fans will take videos of them and then post them to YouTube. 
and you know some people in the band get angry and they say well you know they're recording our, our, our performances and um you know the, the, they're infringing on our music rights which you know technically there's an argument there but is it really in your benefit to send out cease and desist letters to your fans yeah it's very tricky situation, isn't it? So different now. I, I, I remember not long ago that uh, you'd go to a concert and um, some phones, I mean, they would tell you right right away, no photography of any kind. The ticket would say that. The band might even say that. Uh, and you rarely saw a phone out. Now, it's hard to go to a concert and not see a ton of phones pop up right away. Right. And it's the mentality. They've realized hey, it's free publicity. You know, yeah, people. It's trending, and you know, why would, why would I not want this? And I've had you know people that have complained. Not so much with my writers. I've had other clients who, um, you know, blog and have you know commented on something, and we get a you know cease and desist letter for copyright infringement. And I, I just pick up the phone and call the attorney, and I say, "Did you read the piece?" You know, it's, it's saying that your client you know has done something really great. It's this is pure positivity. This is free publicity. Do you really want us to take it down? And almost always, you know, after they think about it for a minute, they go, oh, well, you know, never mind, sorry. <laughs> so there's that aspect to it. You know, now the problem that you have as a freelance writer is, you know, if it's a piece that you're putting on your own website or your own publication, you know, you can make that decision on your own. But if you're writing for a client, you know, some clients, you have to have a feel for your clients. Some clients, you know, they may not care at all. You have other clients who, you know, have a 45-page, you know, specification policy checkbox thing that you have to go through every time you do a piece for them. Um, it just kind of depends, um, but it's certainly something to keep in mind. So I want to shift gears a little bit and and talk about some other questions that are not quite in this area that I get from, from listeners. And, and one of them is when you're writing something for a client, who owns that content and how does that ownership change if the client doesn't pay you for your work? And the reason I ask this is a lot of writers are concerned that you know you, you, you do all this work, you send it to the client, and then they use it. And you know your terms are net 30 days and it's been 60, 90 days. You know, can, is that a copyright violation? Can you send them a notice saying, not only do you owe me you know the, the, the invoice amount, but you're using this content um, illegally. Uh, be a little careful with the word illegally, but yes, yes, no. So copyright is vested in the person who creates uh, the work. And unless there is an assignment um, or you are an employee of your client, um, you know, the content remains with you in my view. And I've had situations like this and where I've written those letters <laughs> basically saying, Hey, you know, unfortunately, as a freelancer, you're going to run into clients to try and screw you. I mean, they're just not going to pay. And that's, you know, a, a problem that, you know, every freelancer and every business pay, um, faces. My recommendation typically is to have at least a tiny contract with them, even if it's just a one pager that has that in there. And typically the way you want to address it is you say, I'll create this work. I own the work. Um, and then upon payment from you, full payment, um, you know, copyright is then assigned to you um, directly. Uh, and that typically will help because if you get that in front of a judge, um, you know, if it ever came to that uh, or in front of their attorney who's looking at it, you know, they're, they're going to have a real problem there because even if it's not copyright infringement, um, you know, it's certainly breach of contract. The reason why you might run into copyright issues is a lot of times clients will give you materials that they want included. And under copyright law, that can sometimes make them a, what's called a co-author, even though they didn't write anything technically in theory they created some of the content that they're giving you and if that's in the piece um, then arguably you know they quote unquote created part of it and it gets into these academic you know issues that none of the listeners want to even get close to but it can get confusing so um, having even just a one page contract and then this day and age with DocuSign and all, all these online signature services these things are really easy to do and most clients are getting used to it so it shouldn't be something that's a hurdle um, particularly if it's just a one pager um, contracts can be long because attorneys want to cover every possible risk but there's a different way of writing contracts which i prefer which is what is the risk we are concerned about address that risk in the contract and you know the other stuff that might happen you know that, that we're not really that concerned about leave it out and so you end up with just a real short contract one page maybe one and a half pages so that when they you know look at it or if they send it to their legal department, there's nothing for them to complain about. They sign it, 
you know, and now you're in a much better position. Um, but technically, yes, you know, in most cases, you're going to own that copyright, um, you know, and whether you want to go scorched earth with, you know, infringement claims and things of that sort, um, you know, kind of depends on the client. If, compliance, if the client is a complete jerk, you never want to work with them again, then yes, go for that. And you should also realize that if you get in front of the judge um, with that and the judge sees, well, you know, I mean, judges are smart. They understand how these things work. And if they see, well, okay, you have a client that's just not paying and is trying to work you over, you know, they're not going to treat that party very well. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and, it, and it does happen, unfortunately. Uh, I, I just tell writers, I've, I've had some tell me uh, this happens, especially if it's uh, something they're going to post online. Um, and they post it right away. And, but their invoice is not due yet. But they're freaked out, and I said, "Look, just relax. <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's not overdue. It's you know, they're, they're they need to use it um, now. Of course, if it goes sixty ninety days, and that's a totally different issue. Um, yeah, and the other thing, the other thing was with bigger projects, you want to have milestones. Um, you know, so you're getting paid. The project's being approved as you move along. Absolutely." Uh, and you're getting paid at those points because we all know the trick, which is they get to the end. They have no intention of paying, and instead they start raising all of these these things like, you know, well, you didn't write what I want, or this isn't what we talked about, or, or you know, those kinds of things. A lot of times you just have to have a feel for the client, um, yeah. and you should, you should look around on you know, Yelp and places of that sort for reviews of that client or any kind of comments. For like, I always do searches for lawyers. are famous for this, and it's something lawyers don't tell people, but lawyers are always doing searches for people who contact them and need legal work um, because you don't want that one nightmare client who, you know, you barely charge and they end up spending 90% of your time because they call every five minutes, um, <laughs> you know, and that's true for any profession. Um, so I would definitely check them. And if you start seeing, you know, issues with them uh, that their customers have had, you know, there are some projects that really just you're better off not taking. So here's another scenario, Richard, that comes up quite a bit. It's you, uh, you're, hired to write something for the client and they submit a lot of background materials for you. And a lot of it is maybe some of their marketing communications and sales materials and so forth. And they said, yeah, go ahead and use this, incorporate this into your piece. Um, but then the client gets sued because much of what they supplied you was actually plagiarized. I'm curious in a situation like that, and this is mostly hypothetical. It's really a fear that many writers have is who would be at fault in a situation like that. So unfortunately, um, Copyright law, um, well, uh, let's back up and talk about um, the elements of a um, civil or criminal um, complaint. When a lawsuit is filed, uh, the party that files a lawsuit is called the plaintiff. The plaintiff then has the burden of proving certain things. And so in a copyright, inf- well, let's forget copyright infringement. Let's talk about uh, just a negligence case. They would have to prove that <clears throat> the party, the defendant, had a duty to do something that the defendant breached that duty, that that breach caused um, damages, and then what the damages are. So you, you're driving a car, you get in a car accident, the other person is drunk, they destroy your car, they have no insurance, you sue them. Um, you would have to prove, well, do they have a duty to, to drive in a particular way? And every state is going to have laws saying yes, and here's what the duty is. Did they breach that duty? Yeah, they were drunk. Um, you know, did they cause damage? Yes, they totaled your car. Uh, and what are the damages? You know, cost of replacement and all those kinds of things. That's typically how that works. Copyright law, unfortunately, is a bit different. Copyright law is what's called a strict liability law. Um, and so all they have to prove is um, that the work in question um, was originally copyrighted correctly, um, that a registration occurred with the Copyright Office at any time, and that uh, you were involved in the work that is alleged to have been infringing and that infringement occurred. Um, they don't have to prove your intent. They don't have to prove you were at fault. They don't even have to prove that you had knowledge of the infringing content. So if we go back to the situation where um, you know you've started your first online business and you create a web, you hire somebody off of you know, one of the freelance places for hundred bucks to create a quickie website for you, and there's a photo there, and that photo turns out to be unlicensed, and it's you get an infringement letter, uh, and somebody was to sue you for copyright infringement, you as the website owner are liable for that, even though you don't, you, you didn't source the photo, you didn't place it there, you didn't know. Um, because it's strict liability and every party involved in that process is liable. So, so is the web designer. Unfortunately, the web designer is you know, probably in a foreign country and doesn't have any money, and you know, they're not going to go after that. So going back to your example, the client gives you materials. The materials end up being infringing. 
uh, whether it be copyright, trademark, or anything, um, but let's focus on copyright, yes, you are liable because it's strict liability. All the parties involved in the creation of that infringing work are liable. Um, now you can assert a fair use defense, probably not going to work uh, with these types of content. Now, having said that, um, plaintiffs are typically looking for to actually recover money when they pursue a copyright infringement case. And they're typically going to not view the writer as, uh, you know, a potential uh, great target for that. Writers tend to be viewed as, you know, not making much money, having few assets, things of that sort. So uh, in that situation, um, you know, your client is really going to be front and center. Uh, and they're going to be the party that, um, you know, the other party is going to focus on. Now, they may also name you as a defendant. Uh, and you're just going to have to deal with that. So a couple things about that. How do we deal with this problem? Well, the first thing most attorneys would tell you is, you know, in that contract we discussed with the client, have an indemnity clause. Indemnity clause says that um, your client will defend, meaning they'll pay for your attorney's fees and pay any settlement or judgment um, that's rendered against you in a copyright infringement case. Um, and that would protect you. It's a beautiful concept. I write them into all of my contracts except copyright law prohibits the use of indemnity clauses. Uh, I don't know why. Yes, I don't know why, um, but it does. It's just, it's, you know, it, again, copyright law was written a long time ago, most of the major foundational pieces, and so they don't apply well online. So what can you do as the client? Well, the best options are really twofold. One is, um, and I, I, attorneys say this all the time, and I know people get sick of it, but, you know, look at forming a business entity. Um, an LLC in most states is probably you know the best choice. Make sure you talk to a CPA um, with the Trump tax cuts. You know there are a lot of advantages now to owning different types of businesses, um, but the tax advantages often come down to uh, how your state treats the entity. So, for instance, in California, um, you know they may LLCs are not a great choice because some of the tax basis um, that they use here, um, but in other states, LLCs usually are. So, anyways, you form the LLC, you form the corporation, whatever. Um, you know, if you got sued and you lose, um, you know, there's a there's a, a essentially a wall between the business debt, that liability, and your personal assets. Um, so you're not going to be destroyed um, by that. The second step to take is liability insurance. Um, li insurance is a boring subject, um, but what a liability policy is going to do is it's going to cover your defense costs again. I mean, it's going to pay for your attorney's fees to defend the action, and then it's going to pay any settlement. Um, or judgment against you up to whatever the policy limits are. They're typically a million dollars. Um, you can call around to pretty much any uh, insurance agency. Well, you might might do a search on Google for one that specializes in IP um, and have them you know take a look at your business and then go out and source policies. Um, you can get policies for you know it just depends, hundred, couple hundred bucks a month, something of that sort. But it's the difference between you know lying awake at night in bed staring at the roof because you got a cease and desist letter and wondering if, you know, this is the final blow to your business. Um, or, you know, being able to sleep well knowing, well, you know, stuff hit the fan, but at least I'm covered for this. Um, so those are kind of your options. Gotcha. Gotcha. What, one uh, kind of variation of this that could happen, and, and based on your answer, I can see, you know, maybe how you could address it is um, maybe what they gave you was fine, but then you produce the work and then you submit it, and then somebody in their office takes it and edits it and uses plagiarized content. I, I've actually seen this happen. That's why I'm mentioning it. Um, and then they publish it. Uh, and of course, let's just say that in that scenario, they get sued. Let's, let's say this person, this rogue individual, stole it from one of their competitors so their competitor sues them and you know now they they kind of want to go after you as well uh so any anything change there in your advice in terms of that situation which you're now at that point you're like completely uh out of the loop uh right right you know unfortunately with strict liability it would depend so and this is going to sound very bizarre but in the construction field uh with condominiums in california california um construction defect law is strict liability as well and so anybody who worked on those condominiums or supplied you know um materials or what have you can be held liable i don't actually know the answer i would have to look at it i as if i was your attorney i would fight like mad on that for the very reason that you're, you're saying um and then you know 
but the other party is certainly going to claim strict liability. You were involved in the preparation. You know, again, here you want records. You want to make sure you have a copy of what you sent them and that it doesn't you know, contain any of that material. You also want notes showing your source. Um, and generally what would happen is less on the legal theory side, more on the legal practical side, as I would call their attorney, and start badgering them. Yeah. And saying, you know, oh, come on, this is nonsense, and make an annoyance out of myself and just get it into their idea that if I'm this bad now, you know, wait for the trial to start. Um, you know, and I have a writer who, you know, of course, has no money, no assets, even though you hired me. Um, <laughs> and, you know, at the same time, you know, we're innocent, we're a little guy, and this evil plaintiff is, you know, trying to trash us. And that's, I'm arguing that to the judge and to the jury and, you know, putting a thorn in their case. Do they really want that there? Um, particularly if my client has any money or anything of that sort. Um, you know, and so there's a practical side to that, and at which point most plaintiffs are going to say, you know, just, just let them go, give me 200 bucks and go away or whatever, um, you know, or testify against the client. And, you know, you're going to have to make decisions at that point, you know, as to whether you're willing to testify against the client. But um, in that situation, you probably would because you're going to testify against them anyways when you get up on a stand and say, you know, here's the copy I gave them and didn't have any of that material in it. Yeah, you have a full paper trail of, of right. how this went down. So it's, I, I guess it would just be the, really the uh, the annoyance and the stress of having to go through this process. But again, I mean, this could kind of a freak thing that I'm sure happens, you know, occasionally, but it's very rare. Uh, yeah, I think the one thing about it, and as we discussed, and we discussed, frankly, before the interview is, you know, again, if you're doing copywriting at any, you know, serious level, um, the emphasis is really going to be on the client, um, because that's the party that they're going to, the plaintiff's going to think they can recover from. Um, you know, it's nice, you know, justice is wonderful, but, you know, the joke among the lawyers is if witness green hasn't appeared, you know, cases tend to go slow, which means if the attorney hasn't been paid, um, you know, the, things move along pretty slowly. So are people going to spend time and money hunting down, you know, a target that they think doesn't have sufficient assets to make it worthwhile? Mm, no. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so that's the way you often want to paint yourself is, you know, I'm the poor rider. I live in a refrigerator box below the, uh, you know, the local bridge and can pump <laughs> out, you know, 5,000 words a night. Um, <laughs> you know, but seriously, that's, that's the way you do it. I've had, I mean, that is a very practical aspect of it that you don't see in TV shows online. I had a case where I had a restaurant owner. The restaurant owner was seriously liable, but was also already in paying um, the IRS on back taxes literally had no money and our entire defense was to meet with the other side show them the bank account and the installment agreement with the IRS and it settled that day yeah I mean what do you want exactly yeah. it get, get in line do. right <laughs> right it had uh, nothing to do with the you know the legal theory or anything of that sort it was look you know we can do this if you want but you're wasting your time and money um, yeah. so yeah, there's a certain element of that when you're representing a writer so I have one more question for you as we as we wrap up, and um, something that uh, a lot of people wonder about is samples. So I've written several pieces. I want to showcase them as samples. Um, if you have something in your contract with clients saying that you know your client gives you permission, uh, or you you, know, you retain the right, uh, however you want to say it, to post. Uh, the work as a sample for marketing purposes on your website, does that, as long as the client accepts that co a contract, agrees to it, does, is that typically enough? Yes. If written correctly, you want to make sure that you, you know, that you define what that is. You also want to mention not just copyright, but trademark is typically their name or their logo, maybe trademarked. Uh, it depends what you're using, but yes, generally that's going to help you out um, and you'll be fine. But if you don't have that clause, um, then technically you would be infringing if you republish it on your site um, without uh, their permission. And it, I've had this come up quite a bit, to be honest with you, a surprising amount. Um, and, you know, writers also have it with, you know, graphic designers uh, and web designers. You know, they often don't think about it and don't include that and assume they can do it. And you cannot um, because once you transfer that, uh, those, those copyrights to the client, well, you've transferred it, they own it. You can't then go do things with it. Um, you know, if you're going to use a piece that you've written before, a small amount, in some other piece, it probably doesn't really come up with the right. It just comes up with software. Um, engineers all the time, software coders, you know, where they'll 
copy pieces and put them in different software products just because it's kind of a foundational piece of the software. Um, you know, those, those people get sued right and left all the time. Um, and it's just kind of a problem, but yeah, so include something in the contract. Again, I would encourage you to have a contract, even if it's short and to the point, um, that just covers some of these basic issues so that if anybody ever comes back and says, Hey, you know, blah, 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 and say, you know, hold the contract up and wave it around and say, well, you know, so-and-so signed off on it. And then that usually results in an internal argument at the client's offices about, you know, why the hell did you sign off on this? Um, but that's not, you know, your problem. So Yeah, <laughs> here you go. It's in writing. Um, fantastic. Well, Richard, this has been very enlightening. And like you said at the beginning, some of this can sound really, really scary, but um, I like the way you approach it and explained it. Uh, really, at the end of the day, there's a practical uh, side to this too, which is I think the the comforting part. Um, but it does pay to do things the right way, do your homework, uh, work with an attorney where it makes sense, and um, and be smart. So thank you. There, sure. There's one other thing that if we have just a couple seconds, I'd like to mention uh, damages for copyright infringement are really misunderstood. Um, so damages are, there's, uh, there are different ways to measure damages in copyright infringement, but they basically break down into two types. One is statutory, uh -huh. and the other is um, what I would call actual damages. Um, so actual damages would be, you know, what's the actual loss? Um, you know, uh, if somebody totals your car, it's $12,000 to repair it, that's the actual loss. Okay, in copyright law, um, if a work is registered within 90 days of creation, um, or publication, actually, um, you can then get statutory damages, and a judge can, or a jury, depending on the case, can award between seven hundred and fifty and thirty thousand dollars in damages um, per copyright violation. And if it can be shown that you willfully violated, then up to one hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars. Generally, in copyright infringement cases, um, statutory damages are really what somebody wants to pursue. And if you get a complaint. Uh, or a cease and desist letter from somebody who really only has actual damages that they can claim, those are usually pretty weak cases. Um, because how do you show actual damages in the online environment? Mm. Uh, so if we have a blog post, so at the very beginning I talked about the copywriter who had the problem where one of the writers had grabbed a photo from somewhere and pushed it and published it on a blog post, and they ended up paying 4000 That's because there were statutory damage claims. Uh, and a judge could award it anything, and so there's that risk. Now, think about a blog post where there's not statutory damages, where the, the plaintiff has to prove actual damages. And let's just say we have that same photo up there that you know your knucklehead web designer took from somewhere and just published it. Okay, well, on a blog that has, or a website that has 50 pages, what's the value of that one photo on one random page? Mm. Pretty low. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? So... So when evaluating these things, uh, if you get a cease and desist letter, talk to a copyright lawyer, you know, you know, and and let them look at it because a lot of times, you know, if the first thing they're going to do is, you know, what's the registration number they're going to send a letter off? What's the registration number with the copyright office? You know, did you register it? Let's see it, and then that puts the onus on the party, you know, that's issued the cease and desist letter to find out, frankly, if they're bluffing or not. Yeah. Well, and, and I know that there are uh, companies out there that are, you know, making a killing, uh, trolling all these sites and trying to look for these opportunities and, you know, feels a little bit like extortion uh, in a way and maybe taking advantage of, of the situation in many cases to uh, make a buck. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the uh, somewhat joke cliche about the law is you're presumed to know all the laws. And you're presumed to comply with all the laws. Well, I'll tell you as an attorney, I don't know all the laws. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know how a layman are supposed to, but, you know, that's the system you have to work off because if it was any other way, then it would be, really wouldn't be functional. Um, but, you know, kind of is what it is, unfortunately. The legal system in the United States is hardly perfect. And I probably don't have to tell anybody listening uh, to know that. However, it is much better than in most other countries. Um, one other thing, you know, you might mention the EU. The EU is rewriting copyright law now. If you have EU clients, make sure you talk to your clients. The EU is trying to introduce things like link taxes. Um, so if you uh, write a piece and you refer to a news organization or an article, the Telegraph, you know, the Telegraph reported, blah, 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 they want you to pay a tax on that. Wow. Well, that's taking things to a whole new level, isn't it? Yes, it is. 
and in many ways the eu is completely out of control there's there's a reason why there are no large uh, internet companies based in europe uh, they just destroy businesses over there i don't know what they're thinking but um yeah so there are a lot of a lot of issues there but uh um, you know, now having said all of this and scared that you know what out of people, um, again, a lot of these issues are, are going to be pretty rare if you're conservative with your sourcing um, and, you know, you're writing original content, um, you know, you're going to be fine. Um, but just make sure that, you know, you cover some of these things or at least think about them. And if worse comes to worse, form a business entity, get insurance, and you can sleep at night. So, Richard, where can listeners learn more about you and your work or if they want to reach out to you, uh, where can I send them? Sure, you can always find me at my website, uh, which is SoCal, like Southern California, internetlawyer.com. Uh, or I'm on LinkedIn quite a bit as well. Um, not really on Twitter or Yahoo or anything. I end up wasting too much time arguing with people. And, but <laughs> you can find me through either of those two sources. Uh, you know, mention uh, Ed's show, and I'll be happy to you know, talk with you for free, give you a free consult. Perfect. We'll include the uh, links to your site uh, in the show notes. And, uh Thank you once again uh, for, for coming on the show today. This has been enlightening. I was scared at first, but you made me feel better and uh, definitely more knowledgeable about uh, the law and what to expect. Oh, it's my pleasure. The High Income Business Writing Podcast is a production of B2B Business Launcher. Learn more at b2blauncher.com.